everybody. Welcome to episode three of our expert assessment series. Uh, we've got an awesome episode lined up and an incredible panel uh, for today's episode. And before we jump into it, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. So we will have a full recording of this and a lot of other useful resources in our Coronavirus Resource Center. So please check that out. Also, since this is a live stream, uh, please let us know where you're coming from and drop your, your name and where you're from in the chat box. And also we have a Q&A portion for the session. So any questions you have for the panelists, please put them in that chat box as well. Um, also, uh, we have our World Workplace. We've gone virtual this year. Uh, so December 9th through the 10th, uh, go to worldworkplace.ifma.org and get more details on that. And with that, let me turn it over to Pat Turnbull, who's moderating today's session. Pat. Chris, and welcome everyone from wherever you are around the world. My name is Pat Turnbull. I am uh, president of Workplace IQ, and uh, which is a consulting firm that specializes in workplace strategy. I am, more importantly, a longtime member of IFMA and a founding member of the Workplace Evolutionaries, and I'm just delighted to be here and to welcome you to this third episode of IFMA's Experts Assessment Session and to Workplace Week International 2020. Workplace Week is organized by AWA, Advanced Workplace Associates, and is an annual celebration of workplace innovation and transformation. Uh, this is the 10th year of Workplace Week. It's the first year of going virtual. And I'm just delighted to say that IFMA and the Workplace Evolutionaries are proud sponsors. The title of our session is uh, Pandemic Pandemonium, Business Leaders Stretch to Reimagine Strategies for Achieving Business Goals and Inspiring People. Next slide. The conversation is going to center around who is and who should be leading workplace strategy. We are going to hear from business leaders who have been instrumental in ensuring their organizations have been able to adapt to the challenges of 2020, embrace the radical change that we've been going through and adjust to this period of agile working. We're keen to find out from them how their organizations have responded, how they're coping, what they've learned, and importantly, what their view of the future of work is at this juncture. As Chris said, if you have comments or questions, pose those in the chat box, and we'll do our best to get to all of your questions and anything we don't get to, we'll follow up with. Uh, 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 so earlier in the year, IFMA conducted a global survey called the Delphi survey, and it was aimed at understanding the longer term impacts of uh, and consequences of the COVID pandemic. A key question in the survey centered on who is or who should be leading workplace strategy. The subject matter experts that responded to the survey uh, in large part pointed to human resources and there were, and then secondarily to the CEO, workplace strategists, facility managers, et cetera. So we began to ask the question, why would they point to HR? And HR is widely seen as the human centric functional area that's concerned with people. Therefore, the logic was that HR should create the workplace strategy with intimate support, of course, from other functional areas such as facility management and IT and co corporate real estate, crisis management and others. But the really interesting thing was that very few human resource professionals actually responded to the survey. So we had all these other functional areas pointing to HR and we thought we better dig a little deeper and find out what HR has to say. So that's what we're going to do today and um, find out what's really happening out there in the real world. Next slide. This leads us to our topics for today. How are organization, organizations assessing current challenges and recalibrating their vision and priorities? What's the role of HR and crisis management and facility management in developing workplace strategy? How are organizations um, turning challenges into positive outcomes. We see a lot of that and we're hearing a lot of that out there. What lessons have been learned 
And importantly, what does the future of work look like? I have a business background, and so I'm really passionate about this conversation and how workplace has become a strategic asset that helps organizations achieve business goals and supports people in living and working at their best. So to help prepare and moderate this session, my friend and colleague Clark Elliott and I pulled together a remarkable international group of experts from HR and facility management and workplace who are with us today. Clark? Thank you, Pat. Um, hello to everyone from Geneva, Switzerland. I'm Clark Elliott. I'm a senior consultant at uh, Advanced Workplace Associates. My background is architecture and psychology. My entire career has been focused on projects that transform the user experience using work environments to create human-centered solutions across Europe for some of the largest organizations in the world. I'm thrilled to be here today with Pat and our four, four panelists who we've uh, taken from the world of HR and FM. Thanks to your willingness to share your perspectives, I'm really delighted to introduce our panelists. First, we have Carrie Smith. Carrie is Director of People and Organizational Development at the British Heart Fund Foundation. Sorry. Carrie leads a, an award winning team that includes people and organizational development, human resources learning and organizational development, health, safety, and well-being, and interna in, internal communications and facilities. Carrie's got over 25 years experience supporting organizations to develop and deliver transformational change. We're thrilled that you're here. The British Heart Foundation's vision is a world free from the fear of heart and circulatory diseases. They have 4,500 persons in the staff, over 20,000 volunteers, 750 shops across the UK, and eight office buildings. Thank you, Gary, for joining us and sharing your experiences. We also have three people I'd like to introduce you to from the RJ O'Brien Company. It's a multidisciplinary team. We have three experts um, from HR and FM. RJ O'Brien very quickly is the largest independent futures brokerage and clearing firm in the United States. They serve more than 80,000 institutional, commercial, and individual clients globally. They have 12 offices across the world over 500 employees, and they've received numerous international awards for being a trusted financial brokerage firm. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jensu Hussein. She's a senior human resources generalist at RJ O'Brien in the UK. Her colleague, Chris, Christy Trank, is a senior benefits analysis, analyst, sorry, I think in Chicago, is that right, Christy? Shake your head if it's right. And Linda Murdix, who's the global director of facilities management. And Linda is also based in Chicago. Thank you so much for joining uh, us for this panel discussion. Pat? Pat, you're muted. Thank you. I love this slide. It was presented by Dr. Marie Pubaro, head of global research at JLL, back in uh, March at the World Workplace uh, Conference, World Workplace Europe uh, Conference. And what I love about it is that it overlays the emotional journey through COVID that we're on, on top of the business journey that we're on. So you might be familiar with the Kubler-Ross research about stages of grief denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then coming out with acceptance. 
And this is something like that. You know, we all entered COVID with shock and denial and then realized we had to respond in order to be safe. And then we went through, you know, radical change in terms of sheltering in place and went through a whole period now of adapting and uh, scaling remote work programs, figuring out how to communicate with our staff and keep our cultures together. And even re-entering has been a challenge because we re-enter and then we pull back and re-enter and pull back. So, um, so a lot of the best of our leaders really to lead, to deliver results, and also to create the future at the same time. So it, it's an emotional journey uh, that takes patience and trust and imagination, innovation. These are all a key ingredients to winning hearts and minds and being able to set a course for future success. In a word, it takes a great deal of courage. So I, I, I applaud all of you uh, who are in, in this uh, leadership role. So to start, Linda, tell us about your role at RJ O'Brien and how your company has responded to the COVID crisis. Sure, thank you, Pat. As a global head of facilities, uh, we formed a crisis management team led by our Director of Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery. That week that it started, we formed that committee and our COO and CIO, FM, HR and legal all grouped together and figured out how we could get this massive undertaking on a global basis since we could not use our disaster recovery sites, how we would be able to have everyone work from home. So we pulled equipment from our DR sites and from our Chicago Board of Trading floor, and we messengered equipment to people's homes, and we made sure that everybody was set up and tested. So it was a huge undertaking. And then we had to make sure that everybody's equipment worked, uh, get them what they needed from keyboards to, to a mouse, to a printer, to a headset, to um, whatever needed, uh, whatever was needed to, to work from home comfortably. So um, our COO really helped lead the charge and we couldn't have done it without IT. It was a great undertaking. Wow. What, uh, what percentage of your workforce was participating in a work from home program before COVID? less than 5% globally. We really do not offer that as a benefit. Um, I know later in the conversation, our HR team will elaborate on how moving forward, we're going to change that. Yeah. And Christy, um, you, you know, your business has special regulations and governance uh, that you have to address. I mean, how did traders end up working from home? That's very unusual. Yeah, we really had to work with our chief compliance officer as well um, to make sure that those traders could trade from home. And that's a continuing conversation that we're having with her right now just to see how long it's going to be extended, how long they're going to continue being able to do so. Hmm, very interesting, uh, a very interesting challenge. And John Su, you, it's a global organization. You have offices all over the world. Were there, were there differences in um, global geographies in terms of the reaction, the way people that react, reacted in your organization and or, um, um, you know, how they adjusted to the changes? Yeah, so in terms of the adjustment process, we tried wherever possible to ensure that as part of our crisis management team, at the least, we have we had global representation. And so we wanted to make sure that the experience for all staff globally was as seamless as possible. Um, and the adjustment was very positive, actually. Um, you know, we were able to get our workforce to work from home within a very short space of time. And um, our IT team, as, as Linda mentioned, were very you know, effective in ensuring it was seamless and ensured that the business was operating effectively during that time. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie, over to you, the same question. Tell us about your role at uh, the British Heart Foundation and how your company has responded to COVID. Oh, you're on mute. I knew that would happen. Um, <laughs> so, thank you, Pat. Um, yes, so the British Heart Foundation is uh, a, a charity you've indicated. Um, we actually put in over 100 million pounds a year into cardiovascular research, into heart and circulatory diseases. 
We've been hugely impacted uh, by the COVID situation. We're, we're losing around uh, 10 million uh, pounds a month, actually. Um, so, so it's had, a, had an enormous impact on us. Uh, but actually, uh, when the situation um, uh, arose and we had our uh, lockdown across, uh, across the UK, uh, we were able to adapt and respond to that really quickly. Um, and the reason for that um, is because we had certain systems already uh, in place and we were kind of well well set up for it um, in that we'd already um, undertaken what we undertaken what we call a smarter working program of work where we had uh, moved our people to uh, a much more agile uh, way of working. Um, so that included ensuring that everybody had a laptop that they could take home. And in fact, yeah. before lockdown um, was, was announced, we were already uh, advising our, our head office uh, and office staff um, to please be taking their laptops home at night. Uh, and make sure that they've got that because we did not know when it was going to going to strike. So we needed to be absolutely ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, but along with um, that, that kind of physical needing to take your take your office home with you, if you like, for, whether you're taking your laptop with you, we also we also had invested quite substantially in the software to enable us to have everything in the cloud and not to be reliant on a particular office space as well. So it was really, um, we, were, we were much you know, much more um, uh, set up for, for that situation when it, when it first um, arose. And um, you've indicated already about the kind of strategic HR role. As it happened, my role covers such a broad range of everything to do with people that uh, one of those was crisis management. So immediately, um, I was in charge of setting up uh, the COVID response group um, in charge of gold, and, and I was the lead uh, for that. So we were able then to kind of look at who we needed and, and to mobilise people to help us work through um, the challenges that lay ahead. It's so interesting, and congratulations. I mean, when you have an organization as big as yours, and not only uh, staff, but volunteers, it's quite challenging to keep everything moving ahead um, uh, positively. But what I heard between the two groups, which I thought was so interesting, is that at uh, the British Heart Foundation, HR really owns it, owns crisis management, and uh, and therefore is absolutely in charge of, of this transformation. Whereas at our RG O'Brien, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was really a cross-disciplinary team led by the COO and the crisis management leader uh, with a broad um, engagement from various uh, disciplines um, disciplinary leaders. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Okay, well, next slide. Then I'll turn it over to Clark. Yeah, thanks, Pat. When you look at uh, the what traditional view of what HR is all about, I think it depends. We've seen such a great contrast between the British Heart Foundation and R.J. O'Brien in terms of how HR was organized and how Kerry is sitting above uh, FM and so many other parts of the organization, as she just said. But when you think about a traditional view of HR, uh, benefits, policies, compensation, um, Christy, do you think it's this is a fair view of what HR is perceived as? Yes, I think the key word there is the traditional view of HR, traditional being the key word. And I'd like to say that through situations such as this COVID response, that we are becoming more involved in, in the strategic um, workforce planning. Um, but yes, the benefits, compensation, recruitment, I think a lot of people still view HR as that, but I hope there's situations such as this that we can be moved more into that strategic planning portion of HR as well. Uh, Carrie, do you have anything that you could add? When did your role at the British Heart Foundation crystallize to give you that, that overarching umbrella to, to really be able to glue it all together? It, was it an evolution of the role? 
Do you know, um, I, I'd probably say it, it wasn't. Uh, basically, um, my, my role right from the start, I've been at the British Heart Foundation for uh, seven years. And uh, right from the start, uh, my role was very much about everything to do with people. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I, I do have an incredibly broad remit. Um, it, it, includes, it includes everything you just described in terms of traditional HR, but also includes, as you said, the communications, um, uh, health and safety, uh, well-being uh, and crisis management. And um, in particular, it includes organisational design development and modern strategic people functions are very much concerned with how an organisation operates um, and what's its operating model, how, it's, how it deploys its people, the culture, the behaviours, uh, the place, the environment, the space. And so all of those things come together um, and always have been um, a, a, key, a key part of my role, which is why, in a way, we, you know, we had spent quite a lot of investment on uh, technology, um, ensuring that we had a smart working um, environment uh, where people weren't glued to a particular desk, but actually could be uh, could be deployed in agile and working communities. Actually, and part of that was a business drive, um, a business drive to ensure that uh, people weren't were uh, collaborating. Um, so moving people off the, the same desk every day enabled people to to mix and talk to people they wouldn't normally talk to. Um, and sit in different places and, and, and collaborate and come up with ideas, ideas to generate income, fundraise for us to put into um, our heart and circulatory disease uh, research. So um, actually, it, interestingly, I probably and have sometimes referred to myself as a, as a, um, a people, business and change leader, actually, uh, because it's, it's, it's combining those aspects that, uh, and how they support an ever-changing environment and an ever-changing organisation um, is actually absolutely critical and, uh, and something I feel I contribute uh, to the strategic, the C-suite, if you like, uh, top table. Hmm. And you use the word strategic. Uh, Jensu, do, can you give us some, some, a summary of what you've seen evolve with how workplace strategy is fitting in to what uh, were these roles as HR responsibilities and how this pandemic has, has brought new, new roles, new responsibilities? And living through it, what can you share with us, Jensu? Yeah, I mean, to add on to Christy and Kerry's points, I think it's really the growth of this notion of the HR business partner. Um, you know, what more can HR do? You know, HR isn't just the traditional tick box exercise, onboarding, offboarding. HR can bring a lot more to the table and actually sit in on the decision making process now. And I think the pandemic has been a really good. Um, you know, platform for HR professionals to say that, you know, we have insights that should really be taken into account when making critical business decisions. So I think it, it's grown the profile of HR professionals in, in a positive way. Um, and it's nice to hear that Kelly's been experiencing that as well within her whole company too. And thank you, Jensu. Linda, mm -hmm. from the FM perspective, what what have you seen happen and how have the responsibilities and workplace mm -hmm. strategy manifested itself in what you've lived through the past months? Sure. Thanks, Clark. It, it's been challenging because normally facilities management is very hands-on where you're managing by walking around and you have a team and you did most of your calls overseas by Teams or by Zoom or by Skype back in the day. And now I still have a team of office services there in the mailroom or answering the phones for reception and have to manage them from home and also globally work with my FM affiliates. So that is challenging for a very in-person job to still maintain the organization, the company, the carpets, the coffee, the machines, vending, any equipment that needs to be maintained to be able to make sure that my staff can maintain that for the workers and the brokers that are there on site. So it, it's very challenging dealing with the different time differences from Dubai to Paris to London, um, Chicago. Your, your day starts very early 
but it's been such a benefit being able to work from home because you can start at 6 a.m., check your emails, and you don't have to commute. So that, that has definitely been a benefit. Um, but again, it's been a challenge to, to do it remotely when you can't be in the office to physically see what needs to be done. Mm, thanks. thanks, Linda. Christy, uh, within your organization, who's leading the more strategic initiatives you're seeing that uh, have been developed in these months? In regards to COVID specifically, it's that, that team that we pulled together that Linda had described earlier, the COVID response team. Um, but we have multiple committees at our organization. I know there's one called EXCO that heads of our um, different departments meet regularly um, to discuss topics and strategic planning. Um, but special projects, I feel like we've started to pull together cross-functional teams. And that's really helped out um, pulling HR, pulling facilities, pulling legal into all those different areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll open it up to the panel. I mean, uh, it's been a different crisis mode reaction at RJ O'Brien and um, well, it's crisis mode also at the British Heart Foundation. But um, Carrie, in terms of uh, what you've mentioned that you had already gone to an agile organization. I'm sure it helped the transition and coping with the pandemic. Um, what did you sense from Christy and Jensu's comments? Did you live through it before the pandemic or did you still live through it uh, during, during the last few months in new ways? Oh yes, definitely. Um, it's, it's been the most, um, you know, unprecedented as we've heard lots of people refer to it as but you know most challenging time we're in, we're in absolute new territory uh with with this situation and um and it's affected us all in, in in very different ways it's been indiscriminate actually in the way that it's impacted us um right across our organization and one of the areas it's hit particularly hard um is across our retail estate so we have uh, we're, we're the largest um charity retailer in the united kingdom and uh, we have over 750 shops and stores and uh, it, it was quite heartbreaking actually uh, when the call to lockdown came and we literally had to never thought we'd see the day when we had to literally close down um, all 750 um, shops and stores and that was uh, that resulted in us having to to, to send home um, around three and a half thousand staff um, staff who are usually, you know, working their socks off and, and incredibly connected to cause. Um, that that just it was just it was a bizarre situation in many levels, but it was a really heartbreaking one um, to have to do that. And um, and that's uh, only part of the challenge. So it's kind of you know we we have a in the UK the furlough scheme um, that we needed to put in place uh, for those people with great uncertainty as to how long that would go on for and who knew that you know here we would be in November um, and we've started to, you know we've both had to furlough people again um, today and actually with such a, a, a mass. Um, massive event that we've had to, to 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 operate. The the closing down was one thing. The reopening has been enormous for us because uh, uh, getting shops and stores back open again is is quite a you know, huge undertaking. Getting some of our offices open again, even though it's for only available for critical uh, people at this stage, um, is also uh, has been a big undertaking. But what's driven us all the way through this is number one, personal safety. Um, and ensuring that absolutely people feel comfortable and safe and confident in the, whatever their workplace is, whether it's a physical workplace or a, or a virtual remote one. Um, but secondly, our people experience. We pride ourselves very much on uh, being driven and making decisions based on the people experience that our people get. Um, so just like a customer centric approach, we take a people centric approach and ensure that um, we are thinking about what is this like for our for our staff what is this like for our volunteers as well because we have a, a lot of volunteers that support our shops and stores so putting that first has meant that we ensure um, that we're always putting in extra support and, and thought just one other um, area to throw in that uh, that hasn't uh, been mentioned yet but I know affects us all as well is that whole well-being 
point. And, um, you know, we've all put, so, you know, I know my fellow panel members have done the same, but had to put a lot of thought into uh, to, to uh, ensuring that we're taking care of, uh, of, of individuals' well-being uh, through this process, whether they've been furloughed and, and told to go home and not work for a few weeks or months, or whether they are working flat out. Um, everybody needs to appreciate the role that they are playing and, uh, and also taking care of themselves and their own uh, mental and physical well-being. And it's been a big issue for us uh, to, to, be, um, to be steering that and, and giving the support that's necessary. Thank, thank you, Kerry. From the RJ O'Brien side, um, have you seen any examples of uh, moving to an agile organization? Um, new, new opportunities, the way people are adjusting? I can answer that. I can elaborate to Kerry's point. Um, you know, there's some background noise. There's a horrible background noise. Um, okay. Anyway, thank you, Clark. Um, to add to Carrie's point, um, it has been so important to keep employee engagement in HR and our admin have done a wonderful job uh, being in constant communication with people across the globe, not only communicating in when there is you know lockdowns or curfews or special government restrictions or Chicago going back into different phases. Our global admin also sends out weekly fun activities for everyone to participate in, whether it's what book have you read, what what have you binge watched on Netflix, or what's your favorite saying. Um, she did fun things for Halloween, and just really keeping employee engagement is so important now because in addition to your manager having weekly gatherings and team calls as a director on a global basis I have to reach out to my team in London or in Chicago realize the time difference and stay engaged so instead of seeing them in the office on a daily basis I have to make a point to call them up or send them a daily email hey how you doing how's your day going and just really keep the team engaged from afar great I think Fantastic. it's Pat's your turn. Next slide, please, for Pat. Thank you. So one of the most uh, interesting parts of this whole crisis has to do with how people react, how resilient, you know, human beings are. Um, and so I'm hearing stories about how companies and individuals are transforming these challenges into positive outcomes. And I was hoping to um, get some examples of how your organization is uh, taking current challenges and transforming them into opportunities. Carrie, can you, um, can yes, you start? Yes, um, I love the uh, lemons into lemonade, by the way. Um, uh, we, we uh, do you know what I um, I'm, I'm a very positive person anyway, but there's a huge number of positivities that have, that have come out of this um, experience. Um, you know, it's given us opportunity to think differently about how we can connect people up. Um, one of the things that that that, uh, that have come come out very uh, we've got some fabulous feedback about and has come out really strongly is that connectivity. Um, that it's created across our senior leaders as well. So um, we we, uh, we have a new uh, chief exec who joined us uh, this year. I think people have probably seen more of her than they would have done had we been in a physical space because she uh, does a regular uh, a blog every week um, and communicates what what's uh, what's going on across the organisation that people can uh, watch live or download and and, and see. Um, but also she's regularly communicating, you know, from her house. So you get to see all of all of her and, uh, and, and, and really start to feel a connection between her as, a, as an individual, as a very human uh, person. Um, and similarly, um, it's the same for, for many of our, um, our teams, you know, that people have connected. We've had uh, random coffee chats where you can uh, go and, and, and meet with somebody you wouldn't normally talk to, to sort of 
sort of a recreate that uh, water cooler moment, if you like, um, and you get put together and have a have a chat with somebody uh, over coffee. Um, and we've also uh, changed our induction. And, and who knew you could actually induct people virtually to an organisation? But uh, uh, we, we what was once a, a whole day in a meeting room of you know so, you know a few few several people had all coming into a meeting room and and uh, meeting new staff and giving a presentation and including myself and, and and the chief exec you know we we, we split it we did it over a few days um, and it, it enabled um, new inductees to get to know each other as well as feeling again very connected to those people because it's quite personal. It can feel very personal when you when you are um, uh, meeting and talking to people in this way, uh, which can is not often the case when it's an in-person um, event. It can feel much more formal. Um, so, so they've, and, and also, you know, it's the art of the possible as far as I'm concerned, because, um, it, you know, many people have enjoyed um, the, you know, being able to connect in this way. So what more can we do? I mean, I'm looking at some uh, setting up some interviews uh, for a senior role at the moment, and uh, we are we are considering whether we have somebody from from another country, just like we've got on this call today. You know, we, we can have panel members that aren't all uh, in London, for example. Uh, they could be other parts of the UK, other parts of the world. So it opens up possibilities for us um, that are actually very exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, that's a very interesting point that you make about extending the reach in terms of attracting and t uh, retaining talent. And really, uh, oh, you know, this this kind of changes the name of the game uh, in terms of how we of how we work. Um, um, Jansu, what were the most significant efforts that you experienced? I can have to get on here very having some hard times with our audio. Um, I think some of the hardest challenges were um, maybe for, for managers at our company trying to get used to managing remote employees. Like Linda had mentioned at the start, the percentage of our workforce that had worked from home before the, the pandemic hit was less than 5%. So managers weren't really used to managing people that um, were away from the office that they couldn't see face to face. So we've really adopted the Microsoft Teams platform that we're really encouraging managers to have video chats on and to connect with their team members, if not daily, at least weekly. Um, kind of going back to your last question, Pat, about how we're turning lemons into lemonade, um, I think Jan Su is on my team and I used to see her on a video chat maybe once every two weeks and now I see her basically every day. So it really has connected a global team um, and we're just trying to get tips out to managers certainly set to continue to support them during this time of how they can better manage their employees from a remote, um, a remote aspect. Thank you. Linda, one more for you. Um, in terms of ensuring health and safety in the workplace, now we've been out and we're sort of going back in. I think, what are just briefly, what are some of the steps that you're taking there at RJ O'Brien? Sure. Thanks, Pat. So we really increased our PPE on a global basis. We make sure that there's hand sanitizers and stations inside every door and outside every door. So whenever you touch a doorknob, there is a uh, hand sanitizers or wipes. We have hired someone in Chicago to do all the cleaning on a daily basis, wipe down the elevator buttons, the door handles, the photocopiers, the vending. So we've, we've definitely increased that. And on a global basis, uh, for the people who are in the office, we ask them to wear a mask when they are away from their desk, not when they're working on their desk, whether they're in a cube or in a private office. Um, we have increased cleaning from building management globally. If there is a confirmed case of COVID, the building management will call me and they will do a deep clean that night. We've had instances where unfortunately there has been something on our floor, not by our employee, but um, by a cleaner. So we've had to ask the brokers who work the second and third shifts to step out or to go home on more than one occasion and to come back in the, for their next shift. So we're just learning to 
make sure that even though those that need to be in the office are also set up from home and can work no matter what the circumstances on the, on the drop of a dime for the change. Well, kudos, kudos to you and all these efforts. I love this idea of proving that things can be done in ways that were unimaginable. So thank you for that art of the possible quote, Carrie. I love it. And turning over to you, Clark. Next slide. Thanks, Pat. Um, as we sum up uh, to the presentation part of discussion, before we get to the Q&A, I wanted to ask each of the panelists, uh, what has been some of your biggest learnings in 2020 so far? I think we could just, we can go around the table, but maybe we could start with um, what you would have done differently back in March, if you had the hindsight that you have now. Carrie, you want to start off the group? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it's a really great question, and it's always important to kind of reflect back, uh, even though we're kind of in lockdown again. Um, it, and that's been quite an interesting process in itself, because it's looking back at what we did in the first lockdown that we can uh, bring forward to, to, to this one too. And I think the, um, the the key thing that I would probably uh, have done differently, and it's what I've kind of slightly mentioned before, which is the well-being, because um, we didn't realise when we first went into uh, lockdown in March that it was going to last, you know, the, the, the three months. It, it felt like a short-term um, activity. I think, you know, in hindsight, um, uh, the, the, the prolonged nature of that um, did, you know, did, does and still does have an impact on people's health um, and well-being. And that question of burnout, um, you know, is, is, is a real, a real thing. And, uh, and I think people have had um, such a long time of this, you know, crisis, you know, when you deal with a crisis, a crisis is often a short term at, uh, event. Um, that it you know has a has a start and a finish and you resolve it and you and you move on. We we are still in crisis mode, and and have been since um, we started our our gold group actually our coronavirus response group in January. So you know it won't be long before we'll be have been in crisis for a year. And I think that whole burnout piece is it has been a big challenge uh, for us. So I think in you know in hindsight I would like to have given more consideration to that. Maybe thought about. Um, rotoring people so that people didn't have to be the same people that are dealing with the same issues all the time, um, you know, making sure that we're giving more um, time out and, and, and space uh, for people. I think um, I probably would have done done that differently with, you know, with the um, option of being able to plan a little bit more, uh, a little bit more for that. Um, so I think that would be a key call out for me. It's that whole kind of even more into well-being. We put a lot in, but I'd probably put more in to to the uh, to well-being support. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Carrie. Maybe Jensu, um, Jensu. I hope your sound is okay now. Um, can you t identify what you see as the most significant challenges for the future? technology or training for managers and people working remotely. What, what is your, your points you'd like to share with us? So um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, as a company working from home wasn't you know, highly um, popular. It was only a small amount of people who worked from home. And so now we are in this position where we need to really train our managers to manage remotely which is something we've not done before and um as we've discussed you know we no one can could have guessed that this pandemic would have lasted as long as it has so you know managing remotely is potentially going to become the norm um even after the pandemic people will probably look to working flexibly even more so um you know learning how to train up our managers to effectively manage remotely will probably be the next, you know, thought process, the next thing we really need to, you know, hone in on. And thanks, Jensu. Christy, do you have something to add to that? I really have to piggyback off what, what Carrie was saying is kind of putting uh, mental health and time away um, back at the forefront of what we're thinking about right now. I think the longer this, this drags on that we are offering remote work, 
people need to have those set boundaries of when work starts and when work ends. Um, I think that's kind of been lost with work from home. It's a lot easier for people to log in at all hours. And so I think actually providing them more resources on how they can have um, like a set work day, promoting their mental health, how to manage manage people remotely. I think those are all key topics for moving forward. Okay, thanks, Christy. Linda, anything to add before we move on to the next? Sure, thanks. In terms of lessons learned, I think being more prepared from a uh, technology standpoint, um, we had an inventory, but not a huge one. We would do disaster recovery tests twice a year where we went to an offsite place to test computers and if, if there had something happened to our main global headquarters or any of our offices, we could work in other places and in, in, in the larger offices. But if, if we had to do it all over again, I think we could have tested from home and made sure that everyone had work from home equipment, whether it was your own equipment, but you could log in from home quickly because we really had to scramble um, that first week to make sure that everybody could work from home. We had to have special dispensation from the CFTC to make sure that our brokers could trade remotely from home. We still have that, um, that where they don't have to use timestamps to do their trades. We've allowed a, a handful of brokers to go in, but on those rare occasions, as I mentioned previously, when we have to close the floor due to COVID um, and cleaning, then we have to make sure that those brokers can work remotely from home as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big challenges. Okay, next slide, we'll transition to Pat and the Q&A session. Hi, everybody. I have to tell you, we have a fantastically international audience that's tuned in. I'm just going to read a few names. Erica from Budapest is here. Joe from Seal Beach. Manuel, that might be Manny, my friend from Chicago, right here. Uh, we have Dubai on the line and Frankfurt, Germany. So we really have a great international crowd. Um, uh, and that is, that is so exciting. So I'm, we're going to move on to questions from you out there that you might, that we've missed or you might want to add to the discussion here. I'm going to start with, um, there's a question here from uh, Michelle. How are you keeping essential staff, staff that have to be on site, engaged and spirits up? And um, let's direct that to Carrie to start. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for that uh, great, great question. Um, and I think that's, a, that's, that's absolutely critical because we need to keep people motivated um, and feeling uh, good about what they're doing. And, and uh, you, you could argue for us that there's a, there's a great motivation because we're saving lives. You know, the more um, you know, funds we can generate, the more uh, we can put into our heart and circulatory uh, research um, and the more lives uh, we actually save. Um, but, you know, even an organization like us, we, we've struggled with this because, as I said before, this is this has been going on for quite some time and people are are tired. They're, they're really tired with, with what's happening. And it changes a lot. Um, the, the UK government, you know, news comes out every day. Things change every day. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are all uh, kind of struggling with that. So, uh, so some of the things we've done um, are to just kind of, you know, keep that connection to, to what the BHF is doing. Um, sometimes we've had, um, you know, uh, uh, professors come and talk to us about the drugs that they're working on around COVID because we do a lot of research. Uh, we've been able to uh, bring experts in to do talks for staff, a bit like uh, what Linda was, was, was saying earlier, you know, getting, getting people involved and engaged um, in, in different activities. Um, and also, um, you know, connecting people. Um, so having um, kind of huddles and team chats and uh, keep, keeping people, particularly those that when we had people furloughed, we put a lot of effort into connection and uh, get, getting people to come to an event every week to, to uh, find out what's going on in the, in the, in the organisation. So I think, you know, the, the key thing is communications, keeping people connected and reminding people that why we're all here and what we do and why it's such an important purpose uh, that we're here still to do. Right. Fascinating. Um, here's one um, from uh, Southern California, Kate. Uh, this is for Linda. 
where do you think FM can have the most impact on new ways of working, workplace strategy, and um, what are the top skills that you possess that have been most critical to your success? Great, thanks for the question. I would say communication is really key. Um, being able to check in daily with everyone, whether they're in the office or working from home, uh, being able to switch gears from the from what used to be managing by working around to uh, actually just doing it remotely. Um, when people are challenged technologically uh, and can't jump on a call, that you call them on their cell or on their phone, really just being able to get a hold of people. Um, I really think being diverse and flexible, um, having patience because you can't just walk up to someone and say, hey, can you help me with this? If you have a problem IT related, I'm not picking on IT, but you have to wait extra long. You can't, you know, they're helping people globally with issues from problems from working from home. So really just having patience, communication, keeping in touch with your staff. Our COO does a global town hall and our chairman has done it as well. So just really keeping spirits up, employee engagement and remaining in touch and making sure you're, your PPE is fully stocked. Uh, our admin did a wonderful job of putting a lot of signage around the office, everything from limiting uh, how many people can be on an elevator to the, how many people could actually be in the restroom or in the kitchen. Um, so the signage, PPE, just making sure that our inventories are really uh, well supplied. Oh, super. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay, and uh, here's one um, for Jan Su. You mentioned that as a result of COVID, HR is now more involved with strategic C-suite business discussions than ever before. Going forward, do you see and what do you see as an expansion of your role as it relates to workplace policy? Um, so in terms of you know, the expansion of HR and HR professionals, uh, you know, this, this has been a great platform for HR to show that it can add value, in, not just in the traditional sense. So I would like to think that going forward, we'll see more HR professionals with a seat at the leadership table, um, you know, putting in their input and their insights, and hopefully take, the business taking on board their feedback when it comes to making decisions. So I'd like to think that HR will be involved in the decision-making process as opposed to, you know, having a business decision made and being told, hey, you know, this is this is what you need to react to. Um, so hopefully a more proactive HR um, approach, hopefully. Thank you. And I think we have time for I have one more question and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Clark for the final, the final uh, big question of the hour. Uh, but um, back to Carrie, what would you recommend for companies who have been successful in managing the crisis, but now want to formalize or improve their workplace uh, strategy? Yeah, great, great question. Um, do you know what? Back to my kind of art of the of the possible. Actually, um, this to me has been a game changer in, in in so many ways in terms of the way that we work and operate. And um, whilst you know uh, you've heard that we did quite a lot of work as an organisation on smarter working, getting a greater agility into the organisation, this is this is blown us away. This is this is stepped things up significantly. And, uh, and and I think it's it's a time to actually take some time out to have a look at what does this mean for us in terms of the the way that we operate, the way that we work going forward. And the key thing to do is to talk to people. Um, so so have conversations, get focus groups going, get discussion groups, and hear from your people in your organisation about what their experiences has been experiences have been of this whole situation what they're looking for going forward um, and, and, and use that information, use that intelligence to start to, to start to do a visioning piece around what does the future work place and environment look like uh, for your organization going forward. And I'd, I'd do that quite broadly and get as many people um, and different multidisciplines involved in that piece of work because people will have very different um, perspectives. But for me, it's, it's, it's a 
big, this is a big reset. This is a chance to think about what could this look like now? I don't think people do want to go back to the way it was before, um, but there's elements of it that people are, are desperate to get back to. So um, so we need to hear what they are and look at what it means for the, for the world of work. So I'd recommend anybody um, listening to be thinking about their own organization and what could the workplace look like going forwards. Fantastic. Um, and we might have time for one more question. I see there, by the way, I've got Canada that, that has been tuned in and we've got Mexico that's been tuned in. So again, this incredible international crowd out there. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, this is from Erica. Do you see an average percentage of staff coming back to their physical workplace? BP fears that we are too cautious with our 10 to 15 percent compared to the other companies in Europe. Thank you. Um, let's start with um, with Christy. Sure, I can hop in there. Do you see an average percent of staff coming back to their physical workplace? Um, I think it's going to be a while before we mandate that people come back. Um, I think that right now it's completely on a voluntary basis. <laughs> um, so I think it's still a little too early to tell um, before we send people back mandatory, <laughs> mandatorily. So I would, I don't know if I can give a certain percentage that we would need to send back right now. Dan Sue, I don't know if you have a different perspective from the UK. So I, I would probably agree. <clears throat> it is quite early to tell. I mean, initially, we have done surveys amongst our staff, so clearly we could see that you were mentioning that too. Because if we're going to come up with a plan, our workforce needs to be on board with it. They need to feel safe. They need to feel that their voices have been heard before we make these critical decisions going forward. Um, and one thing that we're seeing is whilst staff are happy to be in the office, it's getting to the office you know, whether it's public transport and things like that. So, you know, any decisions that we do make, we need to make sure that employee voice, you know, is taken into account. Um, but as Christy said, percentage wise, it's very difficult to tell. We need to see what's going to happen. And, you know, we've we've got news of a potential vaccine. How effective will that be? So there's a lot of things that are currently outside of our hands, but definitely things that we are keeping track of as well. I would I would add one just one comment quickly in a few surveys we've done with clients in projects actually going on right now we've seen 70 to 80 percent of the people surveyed want to work from home too or three days a week. And we've seen this coming across the world from different sectors, different surveys all, also. So I think we're looking at what we're calling the blended hybrid solution. Clark, and do you I, want to do that last question? And well, then... I, I think Chris is going to push us off the airways. Yeah. Chris has got a few more <laughs> slides. We, Chris, I don't know if we could do a quick round robin. If we asked each of the panelists three words about what they think the vision of the future would be, just some core concepts, and we'll hand it over to Chris. Linda? Sure, my three words would be flexible, engaged, and virtual. Gary? Yeah, my three words would be to the, the big reset, um, connectivity, and agile. Christy? I would say flexible, collaborative, and connected. Thanks. Jensu? I would probably say collaboration, uh, flexibility, and adaptability. Great. Chris, we hand it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Clark. And thank you, Pat, for moderating. And as Pat mentioned, um, I want to give a huge shout out to the international audience that attended today. Um, that's really incredible. And, and kind of like as a, a point of the, the topic of this episode, IFMA also has been adapting. Um, so we hope to bring you more engaging content like that. So please subscribe to us and check out um, more engaging episodes. Go ahead and hit that bell in the YouTube channel if you want to see when episode four is coming. Um, and then just real quick, I want to run through a few things before we wrap up. Uh, so if you want to find out more about uh, the Workplace Evolutionaries community, you can go to we.ifma.org. 
And uh, so they've got more details uh, and following up on this kind of conversation, a lot of other engaging stuff uh, for the workplace topic. Uh, also, uh, we flash this up during the episode. We have our experts assessment. The full report is now available and free to IFMA members. So please go to experts.ifma.org uh, to get your free copy. And then also even non-members, there's a comprehensive executive summary you can download for free and check out um, that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we do have, like I said, we're adapting. We're going virtual this year, December 9th through the 10th. Please go to worldworkplace.ifma.org um, and check out our first ever virtual World Workplace Conference. We're really excited about it, and we hope to see everybody there. Thank you so much again to all the panelists. Thank you to the audience. It was a really incredible session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.